So can, you, yes, can you tell us what this item is that you are holding in the photograph? So this is a piece of engineering that I uh, actually found amongst my father's possessions um, probably you know, a year after he passed away, which is in the last uh, few years. And I was just taken by its, its kind of artistic beauty mm -hmm. um, in terms of its shape and the curves that were very much part of, of engineering back then at least. It seems to have a spirit level on it, so it was something to gauge the, you know, the level of something. Uh, it has obviously the gradation for measuring things. Uh, my father was very much taken by mechanical engineering type of, of What of did he do? So he, he started off um, inheriting a, a motor uh, garage from his father, which would have been the f one of the first garages in Meath fancily named Meath Motor Works right. um, and, uh, and then he took it on and then kind of expanded it and kind of became more of a businessman in the end but he always was very interested in in how uh, things worked. Did he tinker with cars? He did a little bit himself but you know he would also put together some chemicals and other things together in little pots in the garage that uh, we'd look at so he was a bit of a scientist at heart but more from the, the mechanical side than the biological side. Um, so when I came across that, I, I polished it up a bit and, and thought I would keep that for myself as a, as a memory of him. That must have influenced you then slightly in your choice of... Yes, uh, he had a very scientific mind and so he, he would have been always uh, probing how things worked and how humans uh, were part of that um, voyage of self-discovery and, and in the case of engineering, how to make things and how to pull things apart and reassemble things. So that was very big. That must have been really nice actually to grow up in that kind of a household where there was just a genuine interest in, interest uh, in something in, in and in world, how things yeah, work. And, 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 and also the tangible side of the world. So he was very much a, a practical man in that sense as well, you know. Yeah. So maybe introduce yourself. So um, I'm Des Tobin. I'm professor of uh, dermatological sciences at UCD. Um, director of the UCD Charles Institute of Dermatology, which is the, the only um, dedicated academic centre for skin research on the island of Ireland. So my job is to lead a bunch of scientists that are interested in understanding skin function in health and disease. And uh, how did you end do up doing that now? So my uh, interest has always been in biology, uh, not really in chemistry or, 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 or engineering as such. Uh, so I'd be the kid that would bring in a uh, you know, a nest that would fall off a tree with some broken eggshells into school to put on the nature table from a very early age. So I was very, very interested in the, in the natural world. And did you grow up in the countryside, surrounded by... No, I grew up in the town, okay. but my mother was uh, a country woman in that sense. She, she grew up in a farm. And so and we had a really uh, big garden out back. And so uh, my mother would probably try to recreate the countryside in the, in the back garden in terms of, you know, vegetables and fruit. Wow, and unusual, yeah, unusual, yeah. 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 So yeah, so that's my, my day job is, is, is as, a, as a biomedical researcher, essentially. Uh, but I always had an interest in, in the artistic side of life too, and, and, and definitely where, where art and science comes together. And of course, medicine really is an art uh, in, 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 in a way that, you know, uh, maybe chemists would be slightly different, you know. Uh, so you can see from some of the, pic the items here that it kind of has a nod to both the natural world Absolutely. and the artistic. Kind so of so what, what, this is the other, I think, item you were holding in the photo. Yeah, so, so this is a, a piece of work that was done by a former PhD student of mine called Sobia Causer uh, um, of Pakistani origin in, in Bradford when I was an academic in Bradford. And I took her on as a PhD student to work on a project involving pigment cells or melanocytes. And uh, she was very interested in, in sculpture or in, 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 in art. And she produced this uh, representation of a melanocyte, these dendritic cells uh, with um, the melanin granules uh, outside. Uh, although they're in blue here, they would be brown black in, in, in real life. And, with right. the, so, and she has written on the back of it a, a very nice little kind of a, a thank you uh, note uh, because she it was the first time she really went, uh, the first of her family to go to university. And um, I was very keen to develop her from a second year undergraduate the whole way through to a postdoc level. And now she's a lecturer in her own right at the University of Bradford. So it's a nice uh, 
uh, kind of reflection of, of someone who's really blossomed herself, you know. Kind of encapsulates yes, more or less everything. And her Doesn't effort and her talent. Yeah. Her, her, her talent and And you are, I suppose, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, That's such yeah. a... So is that actually what a melanocyte, the, the, the structure and, and sort of shape of, of a melanocyte, a, 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 a pigment cell? Yes, yes. Broadly speaking, um, these cells can have immature forms and mature forms. So this would be more like a mature form, mm. that full spider effect, whereas the immature form of it uh, would be as more round, like an egg shape. Why it's actually that shape? So it's to, it's to communicate. Uh, p p pigment cells derive from a part of the embryo called the neural crest, the same place where our neurons come from. Uh, so some people kind of uh, lazily call them the neurons of the skin. Uh, and for all neurons, they have to have these dendrites, these kind of pathfinding uh, communication uh, cellular processes uh, to, to both um, seek out what's around them, but also to communicate with other cells around them. So this dendritic format uh, of the cell is, is very important for, you know, kind of sentinel type cells. So, so these are, are cells that contain pigment, this pigment called melanin. Yeah, yeah. Which is like the, the brown, it's a brown. It's a brown-black uh, melanin, typically, for most humans in the world. But uh, in Ireland and Scotland, a few other places, we have a red-yellow melanin uh, called pheomelanin. And that melanin is, is rather unstable. And that's the melanin uh, that's associated with, with higher risk for skin cancer. Okay. So that's why uh, you know, people with reddish hair would have a much higher risk of skin cancer and melanoma, because the melanin they produce is less efficient, really, oh. compared to, say, African melanin or melanin in in India. And what is its function? What does it? Its function is basically to uh, detoxify the world around it uh, by uh, blocking the um, or screening out the damaging uh, photons from light, from UV light. But also melanin is like a sponge. It's, it, it's, it can bind toxins and drugs and, and loads of other nasties and encapsulate them and keep them away from the delicate parts of the cell. So it's a part of, of our bodies and it occurs in other places in nature that mm. is actively interacting with light. Absolutely. It's very much involved, well, stress of any kind. And of course, one of the big stress on terrestrial Earth is UV stress. Um, but we see it the whole way. If people turn upside down a white button mushroom, they'll see the, the black gills underneath. That's the same uh, it's pigment. It's made from melanin as well. And we see it in in all the cuttlefish will spray uh, its predator uh, with uh, a sepia melanin uh, to, to get the predator off its back. So it has defensive mechanisms. It has obviously coat color function in terms of uh, camouflage uh, in, the animal, in, 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 the mammal, in the mammal kingdom. Uh, so it's a very strong signal. Uh, you know, all the colors we see in almost mammals largely have a, a basis in melanin. So it's amazing that, that, that this is the sort of the colour that nature in yes. mammalians has. has sort of yes, so it's, a, it's an incredibly important for human evolution. It's very important as well because our nearest primate relative, the chimpanzee, if you shave off his black hair, has a pale skin. And as then uh, humans evolved and moved out into the savannah and became bipedal, um, they had to have that pale skin tan up because it's now under the, the force of the sunlight rather than under a canopy in the... In the in the, in, the, in, in the forest. So um, primates went from pale skin to tan dark skin. And then as humans moved out of Africa into northern uh, latitudes like northern Europe, they had too much pigment to, to, to deal with the sun, particularly for vitamin D production, that they then had to, had to lose a pigment again. So that's why we have the emergence of pale skin at that point. So these extraordinary looking items here, they're very fancy sunglasses, uh, you wouldn't be wearing them out to the... No, to the no, very expensive, very expensive. Um, so, so basically, this is very closely associated with the conversation we were just having, because uh, if I did want to go out in very bright sun, I could wear these because they would filter out uh, damaging wavelengths of light. Right. Um, so they have a filter in them, and we use them in the lab when we're working with machines that are emitting light at particularly dangerous wavelengths, so uh, high energy light. UV, is that in yeah. the UV? Or yeah, UV typically, but even blue light, high energy blue okay. light uh, in the visible spectrum, could, depending on its dose, could also be potentially damaging. Uh, so this is really just to protect the researcher in the lab. 
You, f- you you couldn't do it without you couldn't do this research without these. Well, you would damage you would yeah. damage the eyes, and uh, you wouldn't really know that you're damaging the eyes. You wouldn't feel anything, but with time, those eyes would become impaired uh, because the uh, UV uh, stress generates all these free you know free radicals and all these other um, you know very unstable chemicals that then start to break down our, our proteins, our DNA, and our, our lipids. So yes, this is very important, uh, a very important, uh, you can see the sides are also the protective to avoid any stray light coming in. So you're using these and you're looking at, what are you looking at? So we're basically um, in, the, in the lab trying to uh, replicate what's happening in, 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 in nature by having our cells and our tissues in the lab um, exposed to light at particular wavelengths. So these are skin cells? Skin right? cells typically, yeah. Skin, skin, yeah, skin cells either on their own or within a, a piece of tissue that we would get from a plastic surgeon. You know, uh, and we would just see, because um, all tissues have, or at least skin has, photoreceptors of the same type as we, we know uh, for a long, long time in the eye, like opsins and rhodopsin. Yeah, that's extraordinary. That, that skin. I think you, and did you say to me before that, that, that skin has odorant receptors? Yes, so the skin can smell, uh, it has olfactory receptors, it has um, taste receptors, it has obviously uh, light receptors and photoreceptors. We see the skin as our third eye or fourth eye, you know, after the, the eyes and the... And but the you're not telling eyes. me now that my skin can see and my skin can smell. Your skin, skin is aware that it is approximately 1 p.m. during the day because the photo period that's influenced by daylight and, 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 and nighttime has to be measured in the skin. It has to know when it's there at, during the day and when it's there during the night. And there are other ways you can find out the time, but one of the easier ways to find out the time is just by you know, uh, uh, you know, interpreting the amount of light that's actually, I mean, if you just put a torch in, under your hands or between your fingers, you can see light coming through. You can see these red fingers. Yeah. So yeah, the so light is transmitted through skin. Different wavelengths will go deeper. Um, as, you, as you probably can see on that model beside, uh, some of the light uh, will only go to, um, to the upper part. Uh, this is the epidermis where the pigment cells are. So UVB, which browns up the skin, will go to here. But UVA, which ages the skin, can go right down to here. Away. And blue and red and green light can go right through. How far, uh, how far can the, the wavelength? Shine straight through a limb. If under if certain visible light wavelengths will shine straight through the, not through maybe the bone, but definitely through softer tissue. You know. So your internal organs, though, are not perceiving light? That's not really known. I mean, they can definitely get light transmitted to them from a strong enough source, but whether they have the photoreception machinery to engage with that or to, you know, uh, uh, you know, start to interpret that and act upon that, I don't know. But um, we know that many, many parts of the body have what we call circadian clocks. And circadian clocks are essentially um, clocks that can tell the time of the day. Now, most of that is done through light, but some of it can be done through temperature. Some of it can be done through hunger and food. Uh, but the skin definitely has a peripheral clock uh, for light. You're yeah. making me think about skin in a completely different way. I, I That's good. Yeah. We're often regarded as the <laughs> Cinderella of, 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 of the body, you know, the, the bag that keeps all the important stuff in. So I'm kind of just noticing here that the, obviously hair, you know, grows out of the skin. And yes. I, I, uh, I, br- I have this thing here that I, I, um, I think is kind of interesting. Emily Dickinson, uh, the poet, um, I read somewhere once that she sent uh, a lock of her hair in this kind of beautifully folded piece of paper. And I asked my daughter, who's really good at folding paper into all kinds of extraordinary shapes, to work out how this thing had been put together. And she, she made this for me. And it's interesting that hair is used as a sort of, a, you know, people send each other a lock of their hair. It's a kind of a romantic thing to do. and. Um, you know, a, a mother would save, you know, mm-hmm. their child's hair. And it's, I often wonder, like, wh- what hair actually is? Is a hair alive or, or like, it's this, you know, is, is this the thing that I have on top of my head? Is it alive or not? So, no, no. Everything that you see on the surface of the skin is dead keratin fiber, basically. And even a little bit in under the skin, it's also uh, dead. So, for example, if somebody dies, a male, uh, an adult male dies, uh, it's not unusual to have to shave the body, you know, two or three days later, 
and that's, that reflects the fact that the skin shrinks back and extrudes the preformed hair uh, that was obviously growing when they were alive. So the old wives' tale, or old husband's tale of hair growing after death is totally wrong, but of it is possible for the skin to shrink back and, and extrude the previous growing hair. So the hair seems longer than it did when yeah, they were Yeah, oh because my, the skin just shrinks. Earlier. Yeah, yeah. But so a little bit of dead hair under the skin as well, but everything outside is for sure dead. Okay, that's, yeah. that's amazing. So wow. this is yeah, a little um, braid of, of, of hair that you know, that, that I kept. And it's, it's kind of interesting that, you know, it's, I know exactly who, who it belonged to and, and what uh -huh. it is, but uh -huh. it's, it's kind of, um, it's a thing, isn't it? That hair is yes. per obviously yeah. personal to that person. Yes. It means well, something to me. It's very personal to that person. Yeah. yeah. And, um, so one of the big striking things about in terms of personal, uh, Identity um, in the hair we have what we call uh, the cells of these fibers have something called mitochondrial DNA Which is only inherited from the mother and uh, from a piece of hair and forensic Scientists use this as uh, crime scenes. They can uh, you know identify the 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 owner of the hair by the DNA that's locked in um, and it's principally reflecting the mother's line because the mother is the only one who can does that mean, so when they say you get your hair from your mother, is that what that means? No, I mean, there is a lot of, uh, a, a lot of, I mean, some people look, particularly balding sons tend to see which side of the family to blame. Yeah. But actually, um, and it is important that you look at your kinship to see when they balded and how much they balded. Um, but essentially, it can be a male member of the mother or the father's side uh, that can give you a heads up there. Uh, and it's a bit of a, a shuffle of the deck, you know, when, okay. you're, when you come across. Yeah. Uh, but no, the, the, the historical um, interest in, in the hair is very important because, uh, you know, uh, uh, one of my first PhD students, Andrew um, Wilson, got the hair of Isaac Newton and got the hair of Emily Bronte. The hair of Isaac Newton? Isaac Newton, yeah. And essentially, um, it, it was to look to see whether these people had taken anything in their diet or any drugs, um, like lanthanum, alladium or lanthanum, I can't remember what it's called, a form of opium, um, which was popular back then. And these drugs can be detected in hair. Indeed, the British cricketing team was using hair analysis for cocaine abuse amongst some of their young uh, members. And because the hair grows a centimeter a month, you can track the actual period of time when that drug got incorporated into the fiber. And it's impossible to lie because the hair, once it's formed, doesn't go under any other further change. So it's like a time capsule of the body at that particular time. So for drugs, um, but also just even for diet, you know, uh, some of the mummies uh, that Andrew was involved with picking up in, in the Andes and other places in South America, um, some of these mummies were prepared. There were often young maidens that were prepared for the sacrifice and their diet would have been switched from a very basic diet to a very high-born diet. And um, the, the isotopic signals, uh, or signature of carbon and nitrogen in particular, could tell when that dietary change had happened, or even whether they lived by the sea and had fish, or lived in the, in the central plains and had maize. You could also tell. Uh, so you can tell status as well as diet from isotopic signatures in hair. So it's a very, very, much better than bone or nail for giving us that uh, kind of insight into I feel like my eyes are getting wider and wider and wider <laughs> and wider saucers. I can't believe what you're telling me, that so much information yeah. It's, it's, is contained it's that, yeah. in that. And hair is only found in mammals. So the only two things that mammals have, like us, that no other animal has, is mammary gland, the breast, uh, and hair. So they're unique to mammals. So very important for the survival uh, and the, the, the evolutionary survival of, of mammals. That's incredible. Yeah. I, I could actually go on talking to you and listening <laughs> to you all day long, but we better, we better call a halt. Thank you so point, much, yeah. no Des. It's brilliant. No